The Russia-Ukraine war has been going on now for just under six months and three weeks. In that time, we have seen two major movement phases. The first, obviously, was when Russia launched its invasion early in the morning on the 24th of February. And for a few days there, it looked like Putin would get what he wanted. A swift war and a quick end to Ukrainian independence. But unlike in 2014 and the little green men of Crimea, this time the Ukrainian forces were ready and willing to fight. The Russian invasion soon ground to a halt and long, exposed lines of logistics and maneuver proved easy targets for the Ukrainian army, which inflicted quite frankly devastating material losses on the invader, resulting in the second movement phase as Russian troops withdrew in good order from northern Ukraine. After this, the front line has remained primarily static with both sides jockeying for position and both sides having had limited success with villages and strategic points being taken and retaken from the other, Russia having had most of the initiative during this phase. But neither side seemed to have had the strength to truly wrest the initiative from the other and launch a major offensive. The Russians tried it in the east, but were stopped and had to resort instead to a slow, creeping, gradual advance over the course of months. And the Ukrainians tried it in the south towards Kherson, but were also stopped as the war degraded into massed artillery and trench warfare. Up until now, that is. As the situation appears to have changed and changed rather radically as well as we appear to be entering into movement phase 3 with a massive Ukrainian breakthrough in the Kharkiv region that looks like it has reconquered the entire district in less than a week. With photographic evidence showing an advance of 30 plus kilometers, the Russian-held city of Izium fell to the advancing Ukrainian forces in a single day and with it a key logistical hub in the region plus a not inconsiderable amount of supplies left behind. Now to be clear as well, the fog of war is lying thick and heavy over the area at the moment. The Russians are not interested in letting anyone know the extent of the predicament they might find themselves in, and the Ukrainians in turn are probably trying to figure out what kind of an advantage they've actually got here. And so precise gains are difficult to estimate, but seeing as the Russian defense ministry themselves are saying they are regrouping away from the region, it seems safe to say that significant movement is occurring. The question remains then, how significant and how far will it continue? So let us rewind the clock just a little bit to get a better idea of what is happening. The currently ongoing Ukrainian offensive appears, and that will be a word in frequent usage today by the way, to have started near the city of Balaklia, where the Ukrainian troops with surprising speed broke through the defences to the north and the south of the city. Subsequently finding themselves with nothing in front of them, they simply just kept going. And by the time of recording of this video, about 12 hours earlier to be precise, the city of Kupyansk also appears to have been taken by the advancing Ukrainians. As you can see, that is a significant leap forward, in particular seeing as an advance of that magnitude previously took months. And more importantly, with the seizure of Izium, which was announced before the seizure of Kupyansk, the two cities now being on Ukrainian hands have denied the Russians some of their most important and key logistical holdings in the regions. Without these two cities, the position of any remaining troops in Kharkiv becomes unsustainable. And the Russians know this as well, as even now there are relatively reliable rumours of Ukrainian advanced forces near Vovochansk, within spitting distance of the Russian border. If this is true, then it suggests quite strongly so that the Russians have indeed either been forced out or left the entire district 
on their own volition, making this the single most successful offensive operation carried out by the Ukrainian armed forces so far in the war. But let us, for the sake of argument, assume that all of this is true. Kharkiv has been reconquered. What does it mean? Well, let's look first and foremost at the best case scenario for the Russian side first as a frame of reference. As the defense minister said, this was a planned withdrawal to focus on the defense of the Donbas Luhansk area. This is not an impossibility. The Russians have pulled off a successful major withdrawal operation in the face of the enemy before. In the early stages of the war, the Russians managed to extricate themselves from northern Ukraine with genuine speed and skill. It is therefore far from impossible they have done so again. The current lack of footage of massive amounts of captured vehicles, POWs and equipment also support this theory, but there are a couple of things that seem off, and uh, two main things are named Andrei Sichevoy and Artem Helemendik. I am undoubtedly butchering these names, but the point is that the first is a lieutenant general, and the commander of one of Russia's main army groups in the area. His capture has been reported as likely by Ukrainian sources, as in it is likely the man in the picture is him. I am not entirely convinced, he kind of looks like him, but the lieutenant general has some pretty distinct birthmarks on his face, and whilst the lighting and the camera plus the blood and dirt on his face makes it very hard to see, I'm not sure I'm seeing them on this prisoner, so that's a big old maybe from me. But the second person, however, appears to be confirmed via captured documents to be a lieutenant colonel in charge, supposedly, of the 18th Motorized Division. These are some awfully high-ranking officers to be left behind during a planned and organized withdrawal. Then there is also the rumors that Denis Pushlin, the head of the Donetsk People's Republic, has resigned his position, and a strange piece of footage of the man sitting in a car driving fast as he reassures his people that everything is A-OK. -okay. Hmm, he's also raising a few eyebrows. It might not mean anything, but the leader of a country, quote-unquote, driving rapidly through the woods whilst making a rushed announcement over a video stream. <laughs> it um, is a little suspicious. The real answer to whether or not this was a planned withdrawal will come in the next couple of weeks. If this was a long planned for and prepared withdrawal to consolidate forces, then the Ukrainian army should be running into a brick wall very, very soon, and all forward momentum should stop abruptly. If it does not, however, then we need another explanation for the sudden and rapid forward momentum of the Ukrainian troops. And judging by the speed of the advance, that explanation might be a near or complete collapse of the Russian army in the area. Now, this is a bit of a hopeful estimation right here, but the shortcomings of the Russian army have been made very apparent during the early months of the invasion. And with a massive influx of fresh personnel from Putin's mobilization efforts, the reinforcements will probably be of dubious quality, shall we say. And if the governor of the Donetsk People's Republic really is fleeing, again, unsure at the moment, it suggests the advance might be going at a speed that he found very uncomfortable, suggesting that it might not be stopping any time soon. As for the potential consequences, well, the obvious military repercussions are the loss of yet more Russian manpower, materiel, and, perhaps most importantly of all, prestige. Before the war, Russia was a military power. Now, it's a laughing stock. And if the Donetsk People's Republic gets liberated again, then it would reverse Russia's second largest victory in the 2014 war. A terrible humiliation for Putin and his government as they have officially recognized the Donetsk Luhansk People's Republic as in proper official state. 
it would also be a tremendously important win for President Zelensky. The West has been pouring money and weapons into Ukraine for six months plus now, and frankly, they have precious little to show for it. Precious little positive, that is. All Europe and the US have received for their aid so far is skyrocketing energy prices, and what was once an overwhelmingly positive position for politicians to hold to support Ukraine, to the point where it gave Boris Johnson another few months in office, support for Ukraine is flagging rapidly, as people are looking at inflation, energy prices, food prices, and the generally increased cost of living and the ever-advancing winter, and wondering why are we sending millions to some eastern country in a resource kerfuffle with Russia, of all nations? Because of course, the war didn't just reveal the weaknesses of Russia, it exposed the weaknesses of Europe too. Reliant on Russian gas and woefully under-equipped unable to supply the munitions required of a modern war. Europe is certainly not coming out of this all glowing either. And yet all of this negativity can turn around very quickly, as nothing makes people forget about their hardships quite like victory. But is this a victory? If the Russian army truly is fragmenting, then it may well be. Russia's position in Siever Donetsk was precarious already, now that the Ukrainians may have access to their rear lines, it might be straight up untenable. Do they have the reserves to throw into the advancing Ukrainians' path to stop the momentum? Or, alternatively, on the other hand, if we do assume once again this was a planned withdrawal, then they would have done so to prepared positions, and again, the advance will probably stop rather suddenly. If this is the case, then it might just be to Russia's advantage. Now, I know that sounds strange, but um, well, many a time running away is the correct option. As it stands right now, Russia is outnumbered by the Ukrainians, and badly so. Their superior artillery and, to a degree, armoured and mechanised assets has allowed them to maintain the line, but for how long? Well, maybe we now know for how long, but with fewer soldiers, Russia wants less land to defend until it can complete its call-up in the next three or so months at least, and abandoning Kharkiv would achieve that. As Russia hardly even needs to defend their own borders, Ukraine is not going to invade Russia. They can't. It would be a PR nightmare. It is one thing for the West to argue that we need to help Ukraine resist an invasion, sure, but it is quite something else to support an invasion in return. The West has already provoked Russia more than it can, frankly, afford due to its own poor planning and retardation. Thus, Russia can leave their borders with Ukraine near unguarded. But Ukraine cannot do the same. Russia can invade wherever, whenever, and however they choose, because they frankly don't have any friends to lose at this point. But Ukraine does. And so, the longer the border is, the more spread out the Ukrainians will be, and the more concentrated the Russians will be. And since their current ploy is simply to hold out and defend until they can bring up their called up reserves and reinforcements, until they can perhaps even disencourage Europe from any further interventions, well, it might actually be a strategically sound choice. Presuming it was a choice, that is. Now, if you were to ask me for my personal, non-professional opinion on whether or not it was a choice or whether or not this is a route, I honestly could not say right now.
There is not quite enough information to make a truly informed decision on the matter, though I will say the Ukrainian advance appears, again that word once more, to have been in the face of resistance. There does seem to have been a continuous rear guard action, whereas when the Russians withdrew from northern Ukraine, they did so almost completely at once. Again, I have a lot of genuine respect for that operation because the Russians were gone before the Ukrainians even knew what the hell was happening. Whereas in this case, it seems as if Ukraine created a breakthrough during a routine poke. They advanced their forces and suddenly they broke through the Russian lines because the Russians were spread woefully thin. The Ukrainians then, scratching their heads, decided to head on over the next hill and there was no incoming fire. So they moved on to the next hill, and the next, and the next, and the next, and simply just kept going. And this counteroffensive has now been going on for just about a week. If it really was a planned and prepared Russian withdrawal, and they've already demonstrated the ability to do this at the snap of a finger, would they really fight a slow, drawn-out rearguard action like this? Now to be the devil's attorney once more, as I mentioned previously, the quality of the Russian troops will almost certainly have degraded rather than increased over the preceding six months of warfare, to the point where an operation like that may not even be possible anymore, but it nevertheless seems an odd choice, and an oddly timed one as well. If I were to make an educated guess based on the very limited and probably heavily flawed information currently available, I would say that the Ukrainians just happened upon a poorly defended piece of the line, and then did exactly what they should do, poured shit into it. In return, the Russian units were now, oh, well, hell, there's Ukrainians on our flanks, all right. What do we do in these situations? We withdraw and we link up with further Russian forces to rebuild the line. But the Ukrainians were advancing as quickly as the Russians were withdrawing. No re-establishment was possible. And so the Ukrainians kept outflanking the Russians, and so the Russians kept withdrawing to avoid being surrounded, as they should. And eventually, it turned into a complete rout. Not necessarily a disorganized one, but it arrived at the point where organized continued resistance to maintain a line was no longer feasible. And now that the Ukrainians have seized the key logistical hubs in the regions, further resistance is simply not possible. Now this in turn does open up an opportunity for the Ukrainians, because a lot of Russian troops will currently be badly out of positions, perhaps badly mauled and undersupplied. At the very least, they are going to need redeployment and reorganization on a large scale. If the Russians do not have significant enough reserves in the area to halt the forward momentum, then the withdrawal might very well continue the Ukrainians might be able to keep on the Russians' flank, forcing them to retreat again and again. But to do so, they're going to have to cross a river. Now this should be a practically facile challenge for a modern army, but up until this point, neither side has really demonstrated the capabilities to do so effectively on the move. So. We'll have to wait and see next week if the collapse continues or if the advance halts. Nevertheless, it has most certainly been an interesting turn of events, which might be the precursor of something much bigger or nothing at all. Only time will tell. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.